kind of a tea break and there will be some food. So we get a break to kind of hang out. And then as you make your way back to your tables, we are going to do a Q&A on the two messages, Pastor Jimmy's and then mine. So think of any questions that you have concerning what, what Pastor Jimmy just said and what I'm about to say, or any other questions related. And then ask those questions, and the, the three of us, myself, Pastor Eddie, Pastor Jimmy, will come up, and we will seek to answer your questions to the best of our abilities. Then we will uh, continue in that vein. Uh, we'll have one more Q&A at the end of the conference, so you'll have two opportunities to ask any clarifying questions that you would like to, and we're going to do our best to answer your questions. So don't feel like, man, I have all these questions, and, and I don't know uh, where to go with this. At the end of the day, we are going to give you uh, a giant stack of books, and we are hoping that you will take those books and go home with them and, and meditate and this these messages will just expand for you as you read the books. But we'll talk more about that uh, as the day moves forward. All right, so my message is about shepherding the flock. What do we do as pastors? We're all pastors here in this conference, the Pastors Conference. What do we do as pastors? Well, the Bible is not silent on this question. And brothers, we must get our job description from the ultimate authority. Where do we find ultimate truth, ultimate authority? Scripture alone. It's not about our opinions or even what our denominations say. If our denominations even are off of Scripture, Scripture overrides our denomination. Scripture overrides tradition. Scripture overrides even our intuitions. Scripture alone is the sole authority. Well, how do you know that, Chris? I know that because the scripture says it. And now some of you, if you're logical, you might say, well, that's circular. You believe the Bible, it has ultimate authority because the Bible says it has ultimate authority. Here's the problem. Any authority that claims to be ultimate must appeal to itself or it can't be ultimate. So if I appeal to history or archaeology or even prophecy to prove the Bible's true, then history, prophecy, and archaeology are ultimate, not scripture. Make sense? Okay, if that's confusing, ask a question later and we'll clarify it. So, where do we get our job description as pastors? Scripture. And what you're going to get in this conference is scripture, 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 but with a specific focus, gospel-centered view of scripture. Okay? So my, my task here is who is a pastor really? Who is a pastor really? And we're going to be in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 5. And I think I might have <laughs> just wrecked the technology again. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, sorry for the tech problems this morning. Uh, we didn't have a lot of tech problems yesterday. Sorry, guys. Now, this is the theme of our conference here. If you look on the, the banners, our, our conference is called Shepherd the Flock. And pastors are shepherds. There's only one place in the New Testament where the word pastor is used, believe it or not. The, the word pastor uh, is, is, uh, a tight, is a description of what elders do. And it's in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says that Jesus gave gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors and teachers so ephesians 4 11 12 is the only place you're going to find pastor however what you will find throughout the new and old testament is shepherd what do pastors do they shepherd and so pastor and shepherd are actually the same thing so when you see here in first peter 5 um peter calls himself an elder and we are elders Pastors are elders. Pastors are overseers. All those three descriptions, elder, pastor, overseer, overseer, bishop, same thing. All those three are the same person. They're not different people according to scripture. Now we're going to seek to show you that throughout the day, but I just want to mention that right now because look what Peter does. In verse 1 he says, I exhort the elders. Okay, who were the elders? Well, they're the shepherds. How do you know that? Because in verse 2 he tells them, shepherd the flock of God. Pastor the people. 
Elders are pastors. So elder is the office. Pastoring is what elders do. Later, you'll see that we also oversee, or bishop is sometimes translated. What do elders do? They pastor and they oversee their flock of sheep. It's that simple, brothers. Let's not complicate it. Now, what does it look like to shepherd and to oversee a flock? That's going to be what this conference is all about. Okay? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through this text verse by verse by verse by verse and explain it. And the points of the, ver of the verses are going to be the points of my message. That's called expository preaching. I have a message on expository preaching later, but I just want to give you a preview. What I'm about to do right now is what I'm going to talk about later. Uh, in 2018, I was here in Uganda. My brother Phillips over here was getting married, and I had the great privilege of doing his wedding along with Pastor Jimmy. We had the privilege of standing on stage together at Gulu Baptist Church, and I spoke in English, and he spoke in a Choli translating me. And, and afterward, all I did was I opened up to Ephesians 5, verses 21 through the rest of the chapter, the, the key text on marriage, and I just walked through it verse by verse by verse by verse. And afterward, a young man came up to me and he, he was like, I don't know how you just did that. You, you just opened the Bible and you went verse by verse by verse through the Bible. I don't know how you did that. And, and I didn't say this, but what I could have said was, you explained how I did it. I just went verse by verse by verse through the Bible and explained it. That's as simple as, as what expository preaching is. And I'm about to do it right now. So let's do it. So, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's start in verse 1. So Peter says to the pastors, he's now transitioning in his letter, and he says, pastors, listening to this letter, listen up. He's addressing us, all of us here as pastors. And he says, so I exhort the elders, elders, pastors. And then I love what he does next, as a fellow elder. Now what Peter does is he identifies with us. What we have a tendency to do is say, oh, Peter was the apostle. And not only apostle, he was the lead apostle. Peter's like, no, I'm a fellow elder. Me and you, the same. So if Peter was sitting in here today, he would not walk up on stage like this. You small pea pastors, I'm here to show you the way. And he would kind of glow. No, he would be sitting at the table with us. And he would have a spot to speak, and I would have a spot to speak. <laughs> Look, a fellow elder. He said, you and I, brothers, we're the same. That's weird for us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But where do we get that idea from? The text itself. The text rules over our intuition. The text rules over our conception and ideas about how ministry works and how leadership in the church works. And so for Peter, I'm a fellow elder, but I'm a little different. In what way? I was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I was there when he was on trial before the Sanhedrin. In fact, he prophesied about me and said, Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Lord, I will go to death with you. I will never deny you. And what happened? I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know the man with curses. Rooster crows. Jesus looks over at him. They make eye contact. And he begins to weep and run away. 
So he did witness the sufferings of Christ to a point, but he, in, in America, we say bounced. He bounced out. He was gone. He left. So he was not at the cross itself like John the Apostle, like Mary the mother of Jesus, like Mary the, the mother of, of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. He was not there witnessing the blood pouring out of Jesus' body. He was not there to see the spear go in and water and blood come out. But he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And it's interesting that he's pointing to that also to say, I defected. I left the Lord three times. But you know what the merciful Lord, the Savior, does? He meets him on the beach in John 21 over some fish that he's cooking on a fire. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Pastor my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Pastor my sheep. Lord, do you, you know I love you. Pastor, my sheep. Three times he denied him. Three times he reinstated him. And I gave you a job to do. What is it? Shepherd, my sheep. Pastors, this is our job. Shepherd the sheep. This is our primary job description. So Peter says, not only did I see the glory, or I'm sorry, not only did I see the sufferings, I saw the glory. I saw Jesus at his worst or at least in the worst circumstances, but I also saw him in the best. Think, rack your brain, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. When did Jesus show his glory most clearly? Think. I'll give you 30 seconds. There was an incident in which the deity broke through his humanity. Glory was visible. You say the whole time. I mean, miracle after miracle. No. The Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember that? He went up on the mountain. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And literally, he began to glow. Light began to come out of his body. And appearing on his right and on his left were Moses and Elijah. That was not an accident. The greatest prophet of the law, the summary of the law, the greatest prophet of the prophets, other than John the Baptist, Jesus in the center, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Guess who saw that? Guess who was there? Peter. In fact, he was so blown away that he said something stupid. Uh, let's make some shelters. Let's get some tea out here. Let's get some bread and some butter. Let's, let's hang out. Elijah, Moses, this is fantastic. Let's have a little conference here. And then the glory comes down and God in the form of a cloud and the voice of God speaks from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then Peter, I imagine, just falls to the ground. John falls to the ground. And James falls to the ground. And then when they look up, it's just Jesus. And he's normal again. Not glowing. And then he's like, don't tell anybody about that. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Not till later. And this is later. I saw the glory that is going to be revealed. We're all going to be glowing someday. I believe that. that. Our resurrected bodies are going to be so much different than our current broken bodies. We will glow in some sense. Verse 2. So he says, As a fellow elder, I was one who witnessed the sufferings and the glory of Christ. That's my authority to tell you this. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Brothers, there's your job description. There's my job description. You are responsible to shepherd your sheep. Not any other sheep of the pastors at this table, at the tables, your sheep. So I'm never gonna give an account for any of your sheep, but I will stand before God and give an account for my sheep. Those who've raised their hand my church is called Eternal City Church. Those who said, I am officially a part of Eternal City Church. I submit myself to the four pastors of Eternal City Church. You shepherd me and I will be your sheep. Those are the ones whom I will stand before God and give an account for. And my job description is to shepherd those sheep, not anyone else's. 
Now, I can help other people. I can counsel other people. I can share teachings with other people as I'm doing now. But as far as giving an account for sheep, my sheep only. Brothers, your sheep only. What is your job? It's to shepherd your sheep. What sheep has God entrusted to you? Those are your sheep. And so shepherd the flock of God that is among you, your sheep. And, okay, what do I do, Peter? You exercise oversight. There's the bishop word right there. Overseer is a bishop. A bishop is an overseer. Let me make it clear again. An elder is the office. What do elders do? They pastor and they oversee. A bishop is a pastor, is an elder. They're all three the same. They're not different offices. Nowhere in the Bible will you find three separate offices. What you will find is elder, pastor, or shepherd, and bishop are interchangeable in various texts. And we're going to show you various texts in which that happens. Well, my culture does it differently. Your culture versus the scriptures. Who wins? Better not be your culture. Better not be my culture. Because Jesus isn't going to be happy and say, why did you ignore the text? It's not going to be okay to say, well, you know, everybody was doing it different than the text. Oh, so because everybody was doing it, that makes it okay? No. We are accountable to the revelation of God. When Scripture speaks, brothers, God speaks. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? Amen. And so maybe you've gotten the sense already that we who are putting this conference on hold Scripture in high regard. There's a reason. Because it is the special revelation of God that transcends culture, time, and space. Do you realize that Moses began writing in 1500 B.C.? 1,500 years before Jesus came on the scene. And then, in that first century, the New Testament was written. So over a span of about 1,500 years, this Bible was written. And we've had it now for 3,500 years. We're not the only ones in 2021 to have this text. We better not bend the text to our current moment. Amen? Amen. God forbid that we do so. All right, let's keep going. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Now, what what does it mean to oversee a flock? It means that you, as the elder, as the pastor, you need to be able to step back and look at the ministry as a whole, look at the sheep as a whole, where they're at, what gifts do they have, who is God perhaps gifting to raise up to help disciple and lead the church with you. You pour into those people who are hurting that I need to mend, who is straying that I need to pull back, Who is uh, rowdy? We say rowdy in the States. It means um, rebellious. Who is rebellious that I need to rebuke? That's overseeing the flock. You're stepping back and you're looking at it as a whole. You have a sense of where the people are at and you know what to do with every portion of the ministry. You oversee the whole thing. There's an example of this in the New Testament. Jesus claims to be the good shepherd and he says, the good shepherd who has a hundred sheep He understands when one has gone astray, doesn't he? And then what does he do? He leaves the 99 in the care of someone else and he goes after that one. Friends, that's oversight. He's not ignorant of how many sheep are there and how they're doing. Shepherd the flock. That's what overseeing is. It's not a title for honor. It's a job description. It's a job description. And then he tells us how to oversee. Okay, how how should I do this? How should I go about it? And he gives us an attitude of how to go about it. Look, not under compulsion. Compulsion means you feel like you have to do this. Man, I have. It's such a drag to shepherd the sheep. I can't stand shepherding the sheep. In fact, I can't stand my sheep altogether. (laughs) Now, let me confess. I feel like that sometimes. Have you ever been bitten by one of your sheep? (laughs) I have. They have teeth, and they're sharp like wolves sometimes. Like, sheep are not supposed to have sharp teeth, but these are hybrid sheep, and they have (laughs) teeth like wolves, and they bite, and I bleed when they bite me. Right, and so sometimes you don't want to shepherd your sheep. I get that. 
This is talking about an, an overall general disposition. Brothers, when we are weary, when we are worn out in this season of COVID where it's disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, we need to call on the Lord for grace to keep shepherding. Oh God, I don't want to do this anymore, but I know that you have called me to do this. And if you've called me to do this, empower me to do what you've called me to do. Give me the strength to do what you've commanded me to do. I can't in myself, in my own strength, do this anymore. So the general disposition of the shepherd or the pastor should not be compulsion. It should be what? Willingness. Willingly. Now again, I feel sometimes like I can't do this anymore. I've had conversations with my co-pastor here. Eddie, I can't do this anymore. I think you're going to have to take over the church. I've literally had those conversations with him. I've been there. If you've been there, I'm with you. I understand what it's like to want to stop doing what Jesus has asked me to do because it's hard. It's hard work. And it's disappointing work. And it's devastating work. And you're tired and weary. But we must do what Jesus has asked us to do. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, and he's saying the same thing to us, brothers. Pastor, feed my sheep. Elder, feed my sheep. Overseer, feed my sheep willingly as god would have you this is god's will some of us get all tripped up on what is god's will for me shepherd the sheep willingly this is his will for you this is what he wants pastors to do and when we do it guess who's pleased the chief shepherd right here chief shepherd let's keep going not here's another not So you don't do it under compulsion. You do do it willingly. You don't do it for shameful gain. Now, what does that mean? That means you're in it for what you can get out of it. Man, I I just want the money or I want the fame. I want the glory. I want the respect. I want the power. I want my congregation to buy me a new bike. Shameful gain. I'm in it for what I can get out of it. No, that's shameful. Shame means to look someone else in the eye, you know you're wrong and you don't want to be seen and you're wrong. That's why when someone feels ashamed, they look down. They don't want to be seen in their guilt. Now, that being said, brothers, it is right and biblically authorized to get paid to be a pastor. Let me show you. I don't have this on the the text here, but I want to pull it up in my notes. I'm going to read to you 1 Timothy 5. 17 and 18. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Timothy was a pastor and he was under Paul. Paul was his father in the faith. Paul called Timothy his son in the faith. And he is writing a pastoral letter in 1 Timothy to his young pastor son in the faith. And he's giving him instruction. And he says this, 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Elders, pastors, overseers. Let them who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. One of the jobs as an elder or pastor or overseer is to rule the flock. Sometimes you will have to mediate. Sometimes you will have to come between a husband and a wife that are at odds and warring with each other. And you're going to have to come in and say, this is right and this is wrong. You are right and you are wrong. And if you keep rebelling, we're going to have to take it to the next level. You will have to come against people in your church who are teaching wrong and and say, no, you must not teach this anymore. But yet you can do it with gentleness and respect and show them from the scriptures where they're wrong. And if they then continue, even after you've had a, a gracious conversation with them, you can warn them again. And then we learn in Titus, one time, two times, three times, you're out. You're out. Sometimes the pastor has to be harsh. Sometimes. So he says, let the elders who rule well, with wisdom, with discernment, with understanding, with biblical authority, let those who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Now listen to this. Especially, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Did you know that your primary job, pastor, is to preach and teach? What do we preach and teach? The Bible. 
not ourselves, not our ideas, not our dreams and visions. No, the Bible. When Bible speaks, God speaks. We don't speak our own ideas, our own selves. We never point to ourselves. No, we teach what God said to the people. Because guess where the power is? The power is not in you. The power is not in me. The power is not in my words. The power is not in my ideas. The power is in God and God's word. And when we speak God's word, listen, friends, we are speaking for God. Every time you speak God's word accurately and truly, God is speaking through you. Do you realize that? You are, in a sense, prophesying every time you speak God's word accurately. You divide the word rightly and you speak what he intended you to speak. You are prophesying authoritatively. Let me continue. Especially those who labor in preaching. and te- Preaching and teaching is labor, brothers. If you have studied long, you know this is a hard task. You spend more time studying and preparing than you do preaching. I could go on for three hours here from what I've prepared for this. And some of you are like, hurry up, because I'm already tired. I'm not going to go three hours. i got a couple minutes left. Okay? But you know that you have so much more to give than you have time to give on a Sunday. At least I hope you do. And I hope that it's insight into the text, not ideas you've brainstormed. And so he says, those who labor and preach, it's labor, it's work. So it's right for double honor, and it's right to get paid to rule well and to preach and teach well you can get paid and should get paid to be a pastor in that sense. Let me finish it. Then he, Paul always grounds his arguments in Scripture. And so he's going to quote Deuteronomy 25.4, uh, 25, and he says this, For the Scripture says, this is Paul, what authority do you have to tell me I should get paid to be an overseer, a ruler, and a teacher? Well, Deuteronomy 25.4. That's how I know. And he says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And Paul's argument here is from the lesser to the greater. If an ox, a mere animal, gets to get paid to do work, you, an image bearer of God, should get paid to do the work of God. See his argument? Lesser animal, greater human being. If an ox in the law gets to eat, get paid, then you, pastor, get to eat, get paid, from ruling well and teaching well. Do you see his argument? And then he quotes Jesus. He quotes Jesus in Luke 10, 7, and he says, the laborer deserves his wages. So he quotes from the Old Testament, and then he quotes Jesus. And guess what he just did there? He put Deuteronomy, which Moses wrote, on par with the words of Jesus. What does that mean? Jesus was authoritative in what he said. Okay. Now, that's 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18. So remember, we shouldn't do it for shameful gain, but we can do it for unshameful gain. Why? Because the Bible says that this is how it should be. Are you able to make the distinction? Are you? Is it possible for you to shepherd the flock of God, exercise oversight willingly, but do it, yes, for gain? Yeah, my kids got to eat. I need to take bodas. I need to have internet service, etc. I need this to do the work of ministry. But you're not in it for that. That's not your main purpose. You would do it if you got nothing. Because you have to. Because God has called you. Not for shameful gain. Okay, so if we shouldn't do it for shameful gain, how should we do it? Eagerly. I want to do this. I desire to do this. I get joy from doing this. And if that's not there, brothers, pray that the Lord will bless you. Oh God, give me a joy. I pray this all the time. God, let me enjoy the work you've given me to do. Please, just let me enjoy it. I don't care if it's hard. Give me joy in doing it. Eagerly. Not, here's another not, don't do it in a domineering way. Domineering, that word means dominate. We don't dominate the sheep. We're not, we're not uh, dictators. We're not overlords. We don't look down at them and say, who are you little sheep? I'm the shepherd. You know? No, we don't do that. We, we identify with the sheep because we too are sheep. And so we shepherd them as a fellow sheep, yet at the same time, who is a shepherd. And so we don't dominate the sheep. 
No, what do we do? We be examples to the flock. Now, what you're gonna hear as the day progresses is there are qualifications to be a pastor in the scripture. And those qualifications are nothing but being a mature Christian. The reason that is so is because you, as the hopefully most mature Christian of your flock, they can look at you and see someone to imitate. They can look at you and say, that's what a mature Christian is. That's the example I should follow. So you, you remember Paul, he said this to the Corinthians, follow me, finish it, as I follow Christ. So he didn't just say, follow me. No, Jesus said that. But Paul is not Jesus. No, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, the pastor should be able to do this. There's a speaker up here, you can't see it. The pastor should be able to plug his life into a loudspeaker and say to his sheep, live like me, live like me, live like me, do marriage like me, do parenting like me, do money like me, do study like me. You're plugging your life into a speaker and you're saying to your sheep, do it like me. Now that's intimidating, isn't it? Most of us would be like, unplug it, unplug the speaker. Don't, no. And we all have room to grow, all of us. We all need to grow. But the point is, we are not to dominate, but we are to be examples to the flock. We are the ones whom they are to follow as we follow Christ. We are the examples. And then in verse 4 he says, And when the chief shepherd appears. Chief shepherd, you notice the ESV capitalizes. So you know what we could say? This means senior pastor. When the senior pastor appears, capital P. Okay? Who is the senior pastor? Jesus Christ. In fact, this is the very thing that Psalm 23 says. Do you know Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. You know it. And did you know that Jesus comes along in the book of John and in other places and says, Hey, guys, you remember Psalm 23? That's about me. You say, how do you know that? Well, let's, let's go to John 10 for a minute. John 10, 14 to 16, Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd. I am the good pastor. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Okay? So the I lay down my life, that's the cross. The reason Jesus is the good shepherd or the senior pastor or the chief shepherd is he is so good that he substitutes himself for his sheep. Don't kill them, kill me. They deserve to die, but I'll take their place. This is what the cross is about. Just like if you were a shepherd in the wilderness and a pack of wolves came to kill the sheep, the shepherd might step in and let himself get torn up by the wolves and protect the sheep. Well, Jesus doesn't just step in with his shepherd's staff swinging it to, to, to fend off the wolves. He actually gives himself to the wolves and dies a bloody death for his sheep. That's why he's the good shepherd. And he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, he didn't do this yet, so he's prophesying about it. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then the part about having other sheep that are not of this fold, meaning flock, you can think of it as your congregation. The congregation at this point was just Jewish people. He was the Jewish Messiah. But he says, I have other sheep that are not of this Jewish fold. Ugandans, Americans, Canadians. Brits, Australians, South Americans, maybe a few Antarcticans. <laughs> maybe. Probably not. The idea is I, I have sheep all over the globe, and I must bring them also. How is he going to bring these other sheep? The cross. When I am lifted up, I will draw all kinds of people, all ethnos, all ethnicities to myself. I will draw all peoples to myself by the cross. Okay? So, who's the chief shepherd? Jesus. He says so in John 10. 
I am the good shepherd. I am the chief. So this is it, brothers. Listen, we are small P pastors. We are small S shepherds. And we will give an account to the senior pastor. So I don't know if you guys do organization charts here in, in Uganda, but sometimes in the States what they'll have is they'll have, okay, senior pastor, then they'll have, you know, who's down the list. Well, guess who should be at the top of the list? Not you. If you think of yourself organizationally, you better think of Jesus at the top of your church as the senior pastor. You are not the senior pastor. You are an under shepherd, under the chief shepherd, and you will give an account. May I be so bold as to say we must not think of ourselves as gods who will not give an account to anyone else. We are not gods. We are sheep who are also shepherds. And so, brothers, being a, being a pastor is not a, a lightweight thing because we are going to stand before the chief shepherd and give an account for our work. I'm going to let that sink in for just a second. But it's not all bad. Look, and you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Brothers, if we do a good job, by God's help, we get glory. This is a beautiful work that God has given us to do. And if we do it well, by His help, glory awaits us. Not just eternal life, but eternal reward. Friends, do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, store up treasure where? In heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. We should not be amassing wealth or possessions on this earth as our reward. It will only disappoint you. Paul said to the Corinthians, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, We look to the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Friends, our eternal reward is coming for our shepherding. And I am, listen, do you believe that every blade of grass is God's? Do you believe that every shilling in every bank account is God's? Do you believe that every atom that makes up all of the universe, not just our globe, is God's? Friends, he has unlimited resources to reward you eternally. And this text says he will reward you. So friends, when you're discouraged and there's no reward, there's no recognition, there's no monetary payoff, there's no, this is hard, this is not worth it. Friends, we must think eternally. We must imagine that day when we stand before the chief shepherd and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And here's your reward that will never diminish. That's why we do what we do. Verse five, likewise. Now, he's going to switch audience right here. He says, likewise, you who are younger. So now he, he's not talking to elders here. He's talking to the younger in the flock, the younger who are reading this letter. He says, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now, two senses of younger. We have spiritually immature people who are younger, and some of those people might be older than us. This was Timothy's case. Timothy was a young man, and Paul had to instruct him, don't let anyone despise you for your what? Youth. Timothy was more mature spiritually than older men in his congregation, but they were using age as a way to look down on him. And Paul was like, don't. Don't let people despise you for your youth. Yeah, you respect them as fathers, but you're not under them in authority, Timothy. You're an elder. You're a pastor. You're an overseer. And they are your sheep, even if they're older. Now, he does say, treat older women like mothers. Treat older men like fathers. So there's a respect element, an honor element. But who has the authority? Timothy. Timothy. Not the father, not the mother. The second way in which this is being used is literally youth. Young people tend to have, and I'm 40 years old, so I can say young people now. <laughs> Younger than me, 39-year-olds, you know. They, they tend to be unruly, those 39-year-olds. <laughs> Anyone younger than 40. If I was 39, I would say those 38-year-olds. <laughs> Younger people, they, they tend to be unruly. 
They know it all. They have all the answers. Who are you to tell me what to do? Right? It was the same 2,000 years ago when Peter wrote the letter. Nothing has changed. Nothing new under the sun. And so what he says, young people in the, in the hearing of this letter, you subject yourself to the elders. Now listen, he doesn't mean all the elders all over the globe. No, I, in one sense, friends, I don't want my sheep listening to you. And I love you, but they're not supposed to be subject to you. Just like my brother's sheep here are not to be subject to, to him. And his sheep are not to be subject to him. No, you have your own flock. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. But the young people do need to be subject to their pastors. Does that make sense? Okay. And then I love what he says next. Now listen, all of you, everyone, elders, young people, and older people alike, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. Now, humility is one of those strange words. We, we think we have it, but then we miss it. We think we know what it is, but then we don't know what it is. What humility is not is thinking of yourself less than God has actually gifted you and made you. Humility is not, I'm just a worm. I deserve to eat dirt. You know, you're, you're just, you're in the dust. You're not a snake that is cursed in Genesis 3. You're an image bearer of God. So what humility is not is when someone comes up to you and says, Pastor, that was a great sermon. I really appreciated that. We're not to then say, no, it was a terrible sermon. <laughs> Don't ever say that to me again. I'm the worst of pastors. But that's, that's false humility. Because inside your head, you're going, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It was one of my better ones. No, no that's false humility. C.S. Lewis got it right. C.S. Lewis um, said this, and, and I'm reworking his quote. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's Philippians 2. You don't consider your needs first. Your wants first. Consider the needs of others more important than your own. It's almost like you don't exist, but you do exist for the sake of others. If I could say it like this. We're in the room, and what we tend to do is we interpret all things in light of self. This is a little philosophical, but, but hear me out. All things, whether it's an interaction with you or it's an interaction with you, or it's a, we think it through the lens of self. What is so much better is to just be in the moment and not even conscious of self. You're not thinking to yourself, I am here in this room talking to this person. He's talking to me. I wonder what he thinks of me. I wonder if I'm talking clearly. I wonder if he thinks I'm an idiot. No, you're obsessed with self, and that's called pride. That's what God hates. In fact, right here, God opposes the proud. But what? Gives grace to the humble, quoting the Proverbs. No, so what true humility does is it doesn't basically have a self-sense. It is you're so out of yourself when ministering to others. You're so out of yourself when having conversations with others. You're sitting in a room and you're not thinking, what, do, what does everyone think of me? Remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Being selfless. And so imagine an entire church full of selfless people. That would be awesome. Sadly, that's not my church. My church is loaded with selfish people. And how dare you look at me that way? And did you hear what so-and-so said? And did you see what they posted online? And, and it's all against me. Meanwhile, none of it was against them. I, I've literally had to have conversations with people and say, listen, they might have posted that, but they weren't thinking about you at all. You took offense that they were not giving to you. You imagined them saying, here's an offense. And you were like, give me that offense. No, they weren't thinking of you at all. You're self-obsessed. Get out of yourself. Lay yourself down. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will lift you up. You see, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And so this is how we get the blessing of God, brothers. Um, let, me, let me illustrate and I'm done. I feel I'm talking too much. 
Have you ever seen a, a, a film on your phone or in an actual theater or on the television? Let me see your hand. Okay, most of you have. Okay, most of you have. What's happening when you're watching that is you, in a sense, lose the sense of self because you're so into what's going on, you don't realize that you're there watching it. That's humility. You, you lose such a sense of self that you're not thinking about yourself as you're watching the movie. No, you're totally into what's going on. Just as if you come into a room and I have a conversation with this, this brother who just came in here, I'm not thinking, what does this brother think of me? Does he think I'm an idiot? Does he think I'm smart? I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking of him. How are you? How are you doing? What's your name? Tell me your story. I'm not thinking of me at all. That's the blessedness of humility, friends. And that's hard to get to, isn't it? Because we tend to have this boomerang thing that happens. We throw out self, energy from self, and then it comes right back to us. And it's like, get, get off me. God opposes the proud. And what is pride? It's self-centeredness. In fact, uh, the great reformer Martin Luther said that this is sin. Latin, he said, in curvitus se, which simply means this, the self-curved inward. The essence of sin is the self-curved inward, meaning all your energies go out from you, curves back in and comes back to you. It's all about you. That's pride. And that's what God is opposed to. What God wants for you is humility because that's where the joy is. That's where the joy of shepherding is. And that's where joyful pastoring can happen when you have a whole congregation of humble people. So friends, it would be very good for you to preach on humility often so that your people might pray for that gift. All right, I'm done. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to have a, a tea break and we're going to do a Q&A. Okay, so pray with me. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this time that we've got to spend in 1 Peter and 1 Corinthians. Father, we pray that as so much information comes to us, you would give us grace to receive it. Holy Spirit, would you please open our minds, open our ears, open our eyes. May we see things we've never seen. May we hear things we've never heard. And Holy Spirit, would you confirm these truths to our hearts? Do your mighty work of transformation even now as we encounter your word. Oh God, work in us work through us, work among us, and may this day be multiplied into years to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Let's get some tea. We can head out this way, go that way, come around and come back in. We'll take about five minutes for everybody to get tea, get refreshments, and then we'll start the Q&A. And those who might have come late, uh, you missed uh, the, the, the notice. That door over there is where you can go for, for, short, for, for your most short time. If you need to ease yourself, that's the place. Yeah. No, the, the, the one on the right, the, the, the brown one. Yeah. And uh, let's, uh, let's do quickly the teas outside. Please use that door. Get served, then you come back in. And then over your tea, as you take tea, we will do the question that answers so that we maximize. This is going to be an intensive everything within the day. Thank you. Yeah. We figured it out. So what we were doing, we were mirroring this, what was on here. And so what would happen is this, the power saver would kick in and it would go off. Right you change it to display mode. You see here, extend the desktop. So now this is running. It knows it's running a presentation so it won't shut off. And it also shows us what's next, which is nice. So that's what Keynote can do. I'll show you how that works so that you can do it with your projector. Good. Yeah. Did you, did you notice how that was different than yesterday? The reason is because, so, so when I was here, I have, I mean, if you look at my notes, it's a whole different journey. I have an extensive thing on what elders are and pastors are. But I kind of just go with what the moment is. So I do prepare, and I know where I'm going, the general direction, but I kind of allow God to do what comes to me. As long as it stays within the theme and the bounds, and, you know, did you notice how it's a little different?